For the longest time, Katie and I floated the idea of doing an at-home date night using recipes from the restaurant where she's had, quote, the best meal of her life, end quote, WD-50 in New York City. From 2003 until 2014, Chef Wiley Dufresne pumped out mind-bending dishes based on simple ingredients and drawing international praise in the process. In late 2017, Dufresne resurrected his restaurant at New York's Seaport Food Lab to commemorate the restaurant's cookbook release. For Katie, this was a moment she could not pass up. For me, this was an opportunity to experience what she did and to see food in a different light. It was well worth it for both of us. Now, there are two people I can't thank enough to allow me to show you my efforts over the next three episodes. First is food photographer Eric Medsker, who graciously provided copies of some of the images provided in WD-50 The Cookbook. You'll see the original photos of the three dishes I'm going to recreate, and then again in the last episode, side-by-side -side comparison. And last and certainly not least is Chef Dufresne himself. When I reached out to him via Instagram for permission to do this, his response was short and sweet. Go for it. Not only am I grateful for these two individuals, but the entire brigade who turned dining on its head for 11 years at 50 Clinton Street in Manhattan. If it wasn't for all of your efforts in this book, this home cook wouldn't be going for This is my gauntlet for the next three days. Prep day is today and tomorrow, and then the actual cook day on Tuesday, which is nothing more than reheating a lot of these, believe it or not. My first course is a shrimp noodle with smoked yogurt and nori powder. My second course is scallops with pine needle udon, grapefruit dashi, and Chinese broccoli. And the last one is a root beer chew. And out of these three, I've had this one before. The root beer chew is one I really like, so I'm looking forward to attempting to recreate this without screwing up. <laughs> After getting Chef Dufresne's blessing, I don't want to let him or anyone associated with WD-50 down. Caffeine in hand, I get to work on the two easiest items on the list. Rather than going out and buying tomato powder, I decided to make some of my own. Just took two Roma tomatoes, sliced them very thin in a mandolin, then lined the pan with parchment paper, spread them out into a thin layer, and then into the oven at 180 degrees for about four hours. The dehydrated tomatoes then went through a coarse and fine grind to achieve powder form. Noticing a little bit of moisture left over, my wife recommended placing the powder underneath a seed germination station in our kitchen. The nori underwent the same dehydration process in the oven, but only for an hour. I can get that a few more minutes. What do you think, pup? Yeah? Okay, maybe two hours. Regardless, same coarse and fine grinding was applied to the nori, but no additional heat needed. Just like that, two items crushed. Next up is pine oil, which will eventually be used for the pine needle udon. While I could have plucked any young spruce shoots from any pine tree, the only ones around me were on a neighbor's yard. So I ordered these ones from the Evergreen State itself, Oregon. Blend this on high with some grapeseed oil for two minutes, then place into a bag and deposit in a 158 degree water bath for one hour. While the pine oil infuses, I move on to a staple of Japanese cuisine, dashi. I've got some dashi kombu, dried seaweed here. Whew. This looks like it's been preserved, so I'm not even gonna try taking a bite of it. Get this cut up. The easier pieces to put into the pot I have there. So it has just water in it right now. To wet this with a damp cloth and fill it in. The kombu will rest in a 150 degree water bath for just about an hour. It'll become a flavorful seaweed based broth, after which I take the kombu out and I bring the temperature to 180 degrees. Now onto my other hard infused oil, shrimp oil. This will be used for the shrimp noodles I'll make tomorrow. It starts off with a mirepoix of carrot, celery, and onion, all finely chopped. This will eventually go on to heat, but something else needs my attention right now. Hey! Our pine oil is done. Took that right out of the sous vide and into an ice bath. As my pine oil rests, I add some grapeseed oil to my pan, throw in the mirepoix, some tomato paste, and white wine to cook down. This next sound is one that I love. 
Oh yeah, that's the stuff. Add a little bit of tarragon to the mixture, let it cook into a nice roux, and it smells so good it even gets our dog Mocha's attention. Back to the dashi. My temperature has hit the desired 180 degrees. I'm gonna add my bonito flake. It's gonna take a minute or so just to get down there. Then I gotta let it sit for 10 minutes. As it sinks to the bottom, the bonito will add an umami flavor to the dashi kombu. The shrimp shells and remaining grapeseed oil is up next. It's getting some flavor in there, so I actually have to cook this down a little bit more. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add my shrimp shells right now. The one mistake I did with the shrimp oil was not chopping up my shrimp shells. This probably prevented it from gaining more flavor as it sat on the stove top for three hours, then in the refrigerator overnight. Day one prep's just about done. All I have left is to take the bonito out of the dashi, let that rest in the fridge, clean up some shrimp for my shrimp noodle, and puree some cherry for my root beer chain. Throughout prep, three words crept into my head. Quality over quantity. I couldn't tell you how many times I heard this phrase growing up from my parents. Chances are you've heard these same three words at various times or uttered them as a parent, educator, or mentor. As I was preparing this intricate meal, I revisited these words over and over. For instance, the quality of the dish is dependent upon the quantity of ingredients being used. Take the dashi. It's nothing more than three ingredients, low heat, and time. That right there is the basis for many Japanese soups. Next week, you'll see me elevate that same base into something more complex using only two additional ingredients. Complex flavor, minimal ingredients. Also next week, you'll see how the root beer chew takes form. That little square may look simple, but it takes a lot of ingredients and some scientific ingenuity to serve up a nostalgic beverage in a quirky presentation. While my mind focused on the quantity of just those two dishes, it didn't matter regardless how little or how much any of the components used, it always came back to the quality of what was being used. Think of a time before COVID-19 when you went into a nice restaurant for dinner, and I'm not talking about one of those chain establishments, maybe farm to table or an ethnic eatery. The ingredients used, simple and authentic. It's these building blocks that elevate the overall quality of a meal. Many of the specialty ingredients, I'll admit, were ordered through specialty shops online. And that honestly made me feel a little elitist during a global pandemic. Having the time to make a meal like this is yet another luxury many of us can't afford. It made me become more aware that everyone should have access to great ingredients and they can be found locally, but it's up to the individual on finding the time to make something with them. It's not my place to say what people should do, but an observation about how our penchant for consuming food related media may play a part in it. For me, taking the time to prep out components in one chunk of time can help make a weekly at-home meal seem less of a burden. You know exactly what goes into each meal, and the care of supplying yourself or your family with something home-cooked is still there, even if it's a quick reheat the night of. Documenting my journey towards individual food sustainability through social responsibility is my quest to inspire others. If we're able to sprinkle some of those thoughts and a dash of effort into what goes into our diets, the food and the quality and insecurity that millions face in America alone could start to drop. Imagine if that spread to other parts of the world in the process. It surely won't happen in my lifetime, but a world without hunger could become a greater possibility. It starts with the quality of one's knowledge and the thoughts put into the public domain and the quantity of those who consume it. Plant the seed, provide a nurturing hand, watch it grow. It's as simple as that. Until next time, stay healthy and stay hungry. Thank you for watching this episode of Hard Boiled Down. If you enjoyed today's content, please like the video and share it with your friends. Join the official YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter and Instagram.